Picture, if you will, the snug seclusion of a candlelit study at Gaylord College, Oxbridge, on a stormy night in late December, almost a hundred years ago, where Oxbridge academic and confirmed bachelor, the Reverend Professor Dr. Montgomery Mablethorpe Zuma, is seated on a Chesterfield wing-back chair before a roaring log fire to share the ritual of ghost stories over a Christmas bowl of smoking bishop with his coterie of young, fresh-faced student acolytes. Setting aside his cup of steaming punch, he opens the dusty tome that rests upon his knees and begins to read in a mellifluous voice. Obliged by Blood and Other Bodily Fluids by J. R. Dullard A Victorian ghost story of sorts in the oral tradition as read by Sir Christopher Blutch Sir Everard Ramrod QC, retired barrister at law, was a haunted man. Not that the casual observer would have had any inkling from his countenance. In truth, he looked to be a thoroughly untroubled fellow. His pleasant and relatively unlined features, for a man of sixty, appeared to reflect an inner calm. Still sprightly and handsome, he cut quite a dapper figure, always immaculately attired with cropped white hair and beard neatly trimmed. His pale blue eyes twinkled when he smiled, giving the impression of a kindly uncle, or, in winter months, of a stout and stately Father Christmas, a role he had performed with great success at the Foundlings Hospital these three years past, whilst thoroughly enjoying the opportunity to swish around the wards in red velvet robes. Still, appearances can be deceptive, for he was indeed a haunted man. In the privacy of his closet, where the mask could be allowed to slip, and the ghosts of his past could take advantage of him as he lay abed, it was, however, a closet to which he had increasingly retreated after his retirement from the bench, lest any one be aware of his inner turmoil. He was not, let me assure you, haunted by the countless villains he had caused to be hung by the neck until they were dead. The hideous sound of the ratcheted lever being yanked by the hangman, of the trap door falling open, of the heavy thud of the weight dropping through the yawning hole, of the groan of the straining root pulled taut, nor the muffled, petrified screams of the long-departed that ever troubled his ears or disturbed his slumbers. Capital punishment was, he assured himself, merely the due consequence of his expertise as a gifted prosecutor. Throughout his lengthy career, he had felt thoroughly convinced that never once had he been responsible for any man or woman being wrongfully hanged. The certainty of guilt beyond all reasonable doubt was his uppermost consideration and had undoubtedly contributed to his significant reputation in success. And why should it not be so? He had had no need of the financial remuneration. He was independently wealthy, a fact that had always afforded him the luxury of choosing carefully who would live and who would die. His conscience was clear on that score, at least. Never had he need of a job so badly that he would prosecute the innocent, as lesser fellows of his former profession undoubtedly often did. Yet still he was a haunted man, haunted by dreams of an entirely different nature, dreams that reverberated increasingly into his waking hours, plagued by dreams of his unhappy boyhood and beyond, and always following a seemingly predetermined pattern. They would start out cheerfully enough with scenarios in which he was to be found gaily playing with one chum or other, and most often one chum in particular, his bosom pal of old, Richard Cockermouth. But always came the creeping sense of dread that would envelop the happy scene, and with it the appearances of his tormentors, with their red glaring eyes, their ravenous features, bringing always the fear of impending doom. Inevitably, he was woken by his own shriek of terror to find himself stiff with a chill. He was a man of thwarted ambitions, and with each passing day, 
That led him inevitably down the garden path to the family plot, and ever closer to the grave that awaited him there, he grieved for what might have been. Success in his esteemed profession had meant little. Law was the direction his father had chosen for him, to pursue the course of his forefathers. He himself had wanted to take to the stage and follow his natural inclination as a budding thespian. His heart's desire had been to dazzle an adoring public with expert renditions of Shakespeare and the Greek classics. Alas, it was at a time and in an age when such predilection by men of social standing was frowned upon and an ambition doomed to be thwarted. He could still remember his father, his face a deeper shade of puce, one arm stiffly outstretched, his index finger pointing as it accused his poor distraught mother. You, woman, it is you who have coddled and corrupted our only begotten son, dragging him along on your nefarious outings to Drury Lane. Mother wept uncontrollably. Her dear pale face buried in her arm as she sprawled forward among the silver service. His father's deeply disapproving glance had then turned towards him on the fateful evening when, at age eleven, Everard had innocently admitted his intention to tread the boards. Fiddlesticks! exclaimed Ramrod Senior, and added Balderdash for good measure. No son of mine! The tirade that followed had made the crystal chandeliers above the dining table rattled so violently they had left the youngster in fear of them crashing down upon their heads. He half hoped for it, hoped for the torture to end once and for all, for his father to be silenced, for he and his beloved mamma to be gifted with blessed release from his papa's tyranny, even if it be by death. Instead, he had found himself packed off to his father's old boarding school, Dongleton Manor, the very next morning, a place where, he was assured menacingly, they were sure to make a man of him or else die in the trying. He was not to see his father again until his seventeenth year and his poor beloved mother never. He was to learn she had pined away, bereft for the loss of him, ruining the day Ramrod Senior had plucked her from the chorus and made her what he had laughingly deemed respectable. It was only after Everard had assured his father that any such lingering theatrical stuff and nonsense had been banished from his own mind forever that he had been allowed to return, regretfully, to the family pile. In fact, he had never intended ever to return home again, but cruel circumstances conspired against him and it became sadly inevitable. How different his life could have been, he sighed heavily, and rubbed his left thumb over the centre of his right palm, an unconscious action, frequently performed, that somehow seemed to comfort him. His had been, to all intents and purposes, an empty, unfulfilled life, despite his early promise, plagued by a deep and abiding sense of loneliness. Of friendly acquaintances he had many, but such friendships that spoke of depth and width and length were fleeting due to his acquired aversion to prolonged intimacy. Confounded by his son's reluctance to become betrothed, Ramrod Senior had once again interposed himself, taken charge and arranged a suitable marriage to a slip of a girl, though eminently suitable for the purpose. Florence Fluffy Merkin of the Colchester Merkins had seemed the ideal choice. Well-bred, well-connected, with her own sizable dowry and excellent references, demure and virginal. Everard was to quickly learn otherwise. His young spouse's demands for physical intimacy, her insistence that he should perform his conjugal obligations more than twice a year, as he had reluctantly deigned to do, was more than he could bear. And so it was, with an immense sense of relief, that he came upon the dear Everard letter she had left for him on the dining-room table on that fateful day, 
when he returned home from a particularly challenging session in court. She had abandoned their association, she confessed, brazenly, for a swarthy young tinker by the name of Jackie Pedler. Pedler by name, Pedler by nature, it transpired, had called at their front door one summer's afternoon, whilst their maidservant was absent on errands, intent on selling his own hand-whittled pegs, the quality and novel shape capturing her fertile imagination as well as her heart. Jackie was, she offered in a parting stab, more of a man than Everard would ever be, and he could still hear the unmistakable sound of her shrill, mocking laughter echo down the years. The resulting scandal was the last straw for his elderly father, who took to his four-poster, never to rise again. Everard, however, took both their exits in his stride, and not without, if it need to be said, a deep and abiding sense of relief. Free at last. He preferred the solitude to Fluffy's obscene demands, and his overbearing father's constant meddling and quickly accustomed himself to his dull, lonely existence. Or had he? For had he not once known love of the purest, most blessed form, a romantic, passionate friendship of the type celebrated by classical scholars? And it grieved him sorely that it was long lost, gone for good, and assuredly never to return. It was his most profound regret, the one that had haunted him endlessly throughout his adult life. On this crucial evening, having retired after a modest dinner to his library, he sat before the crackling log fire in his favourite armchair, intent on perusing the gentleman's periodical that had been delivered that very morning. Candlelight flickered as the wind outside rattled the window frames whilst inside Everard found himself equally rattled by the announcement within the pages of the journal of the closure of his old public school due to circumstances undisclosed. He retired to his four-poster some time later, but slept more fitfully than ever. This night it was as if all the ghosts of his younger years had had their graves disturbed, and having emerged from their various pits, the whole hideous host now congregated in his chambers, swirling hither and thither, by turn laughing at him and goading him. He woke with a start bathed in sweat, and, finding his room still and empty, he cried, Enough! Deciding in that instance to confront his demons once and for all, and embark on one final visit to that seat of fear and loathing, before the gates were slammed shut for ever. He rose at dawn, attended to his toilet, and having made himself presentable, hurriedly breakfasted on tea and hot buttered toast, eschewing marmalade in his haste. He had then caught the 7.45 a.m. mainline service to Scarborough, before switching to the branch line to Dongleton, he arrived in that picturesque hamlet by 10.25 a.m. From the station he had a pony and trap take him inland the three miles to Dongleton Manor, the boarding school of his youth, and with the clickety-clack of the pony's hoofs on frozen earth ringing in his ears, he arrived at his grim destination. No sooner had the buggy drawn up before the heavy wrought iron gates than a uniformed figure emerged from the gatehouse. Good Lord! exclaimed Ramrod as he stepped down from the carriage. Can it be? Is it you, Oddball? For if it were indeed to be the school caretaker of his youth, one Isaiah Oddball, then he must needs be at least a hundred years old by now if he were a day, and if so, he looked well on it. Young Oddball, sir, came the reply, and with this, Oddball the younger doffed his cap. Young Jacob Oddball, Everard asked excitedly. But it is I, Jacob, Everard Ramrod. Remember, we used to play together behind the bushes when no one was looking. A gleam of recognition flickered in Oddball the Younger's eyes. Why as I live and breathe if it ain't young Master Hardy? Everard beamed. 
It may have been many moons since he had been called by his boyhood epithet. Come to see the old house one last time, sir. I'll go and get the keys. And with this, Oddball turned towards the gatehouse. For his part, Ramrod tipped the driver generously for his services and bid him return by 4pm sharp. Jacob returned bearing a heavy loop of keys in his rough brawny hand and was surprised to see Everard, now alone, engaged in rattling the chains that held the gate shut. "'Tis still a long walk up that there drive, especially as none of us is getting any younger, Master Hardy, if you'll forgive my boldness. Might have been better to take the buggy. Everard smiled. If I'm to see the accursed mausoleum one last time, then I'd like to savour its ignominious downfall at leisure. Oddball shook his head ruefully, strode to unlock the gates, and, with some not inconsiderable creaking of his old bones, he hauled them wide and the pair set forth upon the long gravel path towards Dongleton Manor. What circumstance forced the college to close, Everard asked by way of conversation. Multiple unexplained deaths of the young scholars, Oddball stated flatly. Oh yes, there's been many a queer occurrence over the years since you yourself departed this place. But the final straw, he grimaced, t'was the death of Thwackery Junior. He was quite the athlete, much like his father, but a non-swimmer, thrown into the deep end of the icy lake during the cold snap last March by a person or persons unknown. Drowned he was, encased in a solid lump of ice when they eventually dragged his frozen remains from its depths. Took the best part of a week to thaw him out, even though they put him in the boiler room beside the furnace. Tragic it was. Found in the lake where we boys would swim in the nude and bask in the afternoon sunshine, probed Ramrod. The very same, sir. The best of times, sighed Ramrod, and there were not too many of those as I recall. How fondly I remember gaily splashing buck naked in the summer sun with the other meeting members of my rugby team, all friends together. Your breaststroke was legendary, sir. Was it? Was it really? Well, I never forgot it. Do you remember my friend Jacob, my special friend, young Richard Cockermouth? Indeed I do, sir. Who could forget Master Dickie? Everard was relieved. There had been occasions over the years when he had doubted his own fading memories and had even wondered in the wee small hours if Dickie hadn't just been a figment of his own classical education, but here was a living witness contemporaneous to the time. He was very attached to me, was Dickie, Everard recalled fondly. As you always was to Dick, sir, Oddball replied. I renowned for it, as I recall. A brief silence ensued in the face of the undeniable. Ramrod had looked forward, somewhat perversely, to the first glimpse of the imposing monstrosity of his youth, but the mist that had descended lay thick and heavy. Finally, however, out of the luminous haze emerged its ramparts and it slowly loomed into view. The Gothic silhouette was unmistakable. Dongleton Manor had first been constructed in 1827 by T.P. Fartington with later additions, principally the Great Hall in 1856 by Sir Philip Soros. Built of pale local sandstone now crumbling, it was festooned with a multitude of monstrous weather-beaten gargoyles which failed to distract from the slime-green moss-covered slate-tile roofs. Planned as a quadrangle open on the west side, having a bell tower to the centre, a school chapel forming the southern right wing, and extensive boarding accommodation with attics for the housemasters in the left wing. Out of sight, playing fields extended to the rear, and the lake lay further beyond. It was altogether as imposing as it was hideous, and sadly, just as he remembered. Suddenly, his meditation was rudely interrupted as rooks cawed overhead, and, with an instinct resembling fear, 
Everard looked up to the balustrade surmounting the bell tower from whence the birds fled in panic. Did his eyes deceive him, or was there a scarecrow standing erect, wild strands of hair blown into a fury by the flapping of wings, with its arms tethered to the crenellations as it looked down defiantly? Even as he felt the inhuman chill, he blinked, and in the instant the figure disappeared. He struggled to compose himself, distract himself, but noted that his companion was oblivious, intent on filling his meerschaum pipe. And what of you, Jacob? What will happen to you now? Jacob struck a match. It flared. He cut the light with his gnarled hand, lit the tobacco and puffed. Nothing for it, sir, but to pack up my old bones and shuffle off to the nearest workhouse. Surely not, Everard, exclaimed aghast. Surely so, sir, Oddball replied resignedly. Lodgings were only guaranteed so long as I was in the employ of yon manor. But now it is to be sold, and then there'll be no need for the services of this old faithful. Ramrod plucked a card from his waistcoat pocket and handed it to the old retainer. You were always a good fellow, Jacob, and I would no sooner see you in the workhouse than my own dear mamma, he declared. Contact me as an imperative, I assure you, upon my life. I will find you alternative employment, as befits your many and varied talents. Oddball pulled on his forelock. Why, sir? Thank you, sir. Much obliged, sir. And having reached the front door of Dongleton Manor, Oddball handed over the keys. Take your time, sir. You can leave the keys at the gatehouse once you are fully satisfied. Not without difficulty, Ramrod turned the key in the rusty lock, forced the front door open, and entered into the solitude of the lofty entrance hall. With only the echo of his heels clattering on the bare wooden floorboards for company, Everard recalled his first night as boarder at Dongleton Manor, when he had also felt as entirely alone as in this very moment. The melancholy frame of mind he experienced at the time seemed to overwhelm him once more. It had been cold outside, but indoors it struck him as even colder, if that were indeed possible. His very breath formed a mist as he exhaled, and he turned up the collar of his greatcoat in a vain attempt to stave off the bitter chill, a stiff chill that he had a memory of many times before. Grey light strained through dirty windows as he wandered the empty halls. He recalled the state of shock, the fright, the profound sinking of his heart as he wept that first night in his lonely cot. How he had swiftly determined that revealing such feelings, instead of soliciting help and consolation, would only attract the gloating, predatory fascination of both housemasters and fellow boarders alike. Everard had had the misfortune of being designated boarder of Hull House, which was managed, or rather mismanaged, by the school despot, Housemaster Enoch Bedroom, Responsible for the supervision and care of boarders living in his house, Bedroom did nothing of the sort. He did not so much live on the premises as lurked in its darkened corners, waiting to pounce. Thin as a rake, with pinched features and thin greasy hair that hung to his shoulders, and with a smile that would curdle milk, Bedroom was as ugly on the outside as he was within. Yet he gave the impression that he considered himself very grand, far too grand for the task he now found himself performing. This housemaster's primary role appeared to be recruiting senior prefects from amongst his favourites to do his dirty work. Abusing his boarders' physical and mental well-being appeared to be his main source of amusement and ensured the vile reputation that his house developed. It was at that point in Everard's history, removed from everything familiar and comforting, that he decided to cut himself off from his feelings, feelings that were too great to bear. Henceforth he would hide them even from himself. 
This deepest form of dishonesty became second nature. In this he was aided by his physicality, for even at eleven he was both tall and surprisingly well developed for his age, and more than a match for the bully boys who got short shrift from his talented fists. That was until he met Dicky. As he ascended the elaborately carved and imposing oak staircase, noting the stain and mildew plaster, missing in places as the building fell into disrepair, he could have sworn he heard the sound of footfalls at a distance overhead, and in the self-same moment heard the creak of floorboards on the landing below. It gave him an altogether queer feeling, all the queerer because he knew the building to be entirely unoccupied, save for his own good self. He stood silently for a moment and listened. There was no sound now but for a touch of wind and a faint scratching of rats behind the wainscot. He laughed nervously at his foolishness and continued his exploration. Ah, yes, dear, dear Dicky. His first sight of young Dick was of him standing on the sidelines of the rugby pitch as Everard had captained the school eleven. Strawberry blonde curls, rosy cheeks, soft wet lips, like a cupid's bow and opalescent eyes had seemed to follow him wherever he ran, wherever he tackled or grappled in the mud with some beefy opponent. That was Dickie's first day, having transferred in from another school in his sixteenth year, though the circumstances that necessitated his transfer were shrouded in mystery. The bully boys, of which there was no shortage at Dongleton, innately knew where to target weakness. After one night of grace, Dicky would undoubtedly suffer bullying at its most relentless by day and by night. Pastoral care was not included in the vocabulary of the housemasters at Dongleton, as exemplified by Enoch Bedroom. Indifference in the face of plight of those entrusted to their dubious care was the norm. Dicky would be left to sink or swim, unless Everard himself chose to step up to the plate and intervene. And intervene he did. He had stumbled upon Bedroom's favourite, Thwackery Senior, and his cronies in the first floor urinal, having cornered their prey. Arch bully boy Thwackery was too busy flicking the riding crop menacingly over the palm of his own hand, in perverse delight, to notice Everard coming up behind him. Until, that is, he felt the hand on his shoulder jerk him around and had his nose greet Everard's clenched and powerful fist in an explosion of bone and blood. From that day on, Dicky and Everard were inseparable. He moved him into his private rooms and became his mentor and protector. For his part, Everard could not have wished for a better friend. Dickie's manner was loving and gentle, and above all, accommodating. As an illustration, the Book of Kings states that David, in his old age, could not keep warm, although his servants covered him with blankets. So his official said to him, Your Majesty, let us find a young woman to stay with you and take care of you. She will lie close to you and keep you warm. Everard was as cold of a night as any David, and as no woman was available, Dicky, with his religious bent, was only too happy to oblige and defrost his stiff chill. Within minutes of lights out, young Cockermouth would have assumed the position, but all was returning to his own bed before dawn's early light, for fear of their mutually beneficial arrangements being discovered and misinterpreted. Always, that is, except for the fateful morning they overslept. Everard, being rudely awakened by their housemaster, the ever-leering and disagreeable Enoch Bedroom, grabbing his comrade's nightshirt by the collar, yanking him out of bed and flinging him unceremoniously to the other side of the room. Everard leapt out of his bed with one single mighty bound 
and began pummeling his fist against the pigeon chest of housemaster bedroom. Take your hands off my dicky, you cad, you bounder, Everard cried, before clapping him around the ears in a blind fit of fury until his defeated opponent fell at his feet in a crumpled heap. In so doing, a large penknife tumbled from the housemaster's waistcoat pocket, and, having retrieved it from the floor, Everard pulled the blade erect. He knew what he had to do. In the instant, he had decided that Dicky and he would become blood brothers, never to be parted, and acting upon that decision, made an incision in his right palm. Tragically, the blade was not sterilised, and septicemia set in almost instantly. Within moments of the boys clasping their bloody palms together, Everard was comatose, and thereafter hauled off to the hospital wing, where he remained for a month, and was then transferred to a sanatorium for another six. He never returned to Dongleton, but completed his studies while convalescing in his bath chair. Dickie was gone now, vanished, as was Master Bedroom. No one would say why or where. Their well-made plans of running off to join the circus together had been dashed. All hope gone. Having climbed a second flight, Ramrod found himself standing at the door of what had once long ago been his quarters. That private room his father's wealth had afforded him. He stared at the doorknob and then reached out a hand and fondled it affectionately before twisting and pushing the door inward. He was to find in the instant that he was not alone. There, framed in the iron-latched window with back towards him, stood the stately figure of a well-dressed gentleman, silent and still. The figure slowly turned its head round, and in that very moment recognition struck. The strawberry blonde curls were gone, replaced by closely cropped snow-white hair. A rugged complexion replaced the once rosy cheeks, and a goatee framed the man's lips. But such a pair of lips, the cupid's bow, the startling opalescent eyes. Dicky held out his hand. Everard took it firmly, but instead of shaking it, he turned it palm upward so as to expose the small, pink but undeniable scar that lay there. Everard's thumb brushed across it. In the history of humanity, no digit had ever conveyed a deeper expression of tenderness. Dicky, oh my Dicky, Everard cried as the two men fell into each other's arms and embraced. Kiss me, Hardy, Dicky cried, as wet, manly kisses were exchanged, raining down ferociously on one another's tear-streaked cheeks. Finally, reluctantly, breaking apart, they held both each other's hands and sat on the window seat, staring into each other's faces, deeply inquisitive eyes tracing the passage of time. They sat in quiet contentment, Cockermouth's glorious smile being antidote to so many years of pain and suffering, neither wanting to break the spell of their silent intercourse. At last, Everard spoke. How, however, did you gain entrance, he asked. Jimmy, the window in the basement, I have acquired all kinds of skills in the intervening years, he grinned. But what happened, Dicky? All those years ago, after they carried you off to hospital wing, you mean? Yes, and spare me no detail. At this, Dicky shared his sad and sorry tale. Bedroom had snuffed it, he said, without the least trace of remorse. It was no more, no less than the sad old sack deserved, as you know, but it looked bad for both of us. I took the fall to protect you, dearest pal. I claimed in my defence that he had attacked us, pointed to the knife, the blood, as evidence, protested that I had had to defend our honour, and in so doing. But it did me little good. I was hauled up before the magistrates. 
by turn convicted of manslaughter and sentenced to ten years of penal servitude in the Australias with the caveat that I could not return to these fair isles for forty-three years. We set sail on the 30th of September 1867 on the Hougamont, the last convict ship to leave Britain, and arrived in Western Australia on the 10th of January 1868. But why didn't you write, Everard wept? Dickie looked at him sadly. I couldn't afford the stamp. He shook his head. On the very day the ten years were up and I was liberated, I celebrated with a bag of fish and chips, and there, in the newspaper wrapped round them, I saw the announcement of your wedding. I had hoped but realised in that instance that a married man had no longer need of a friend such as I. How is your wife, by the way? Everard smiled wanly. The last I heard, she had changed her name to Madame Gypsy Rosalinda and was telling fortunes on Brighton Palace Pier. Dickie gasped. I'm sorry. Don't be, I'm not, Everard remarked. Apparently she's quite the attraction. But why did you return here today? Some might call it a premonition, Gypsy Rosalinda doubtless would, but I would call it obligation, he replied. Obliged by the tears I shed, by the sweat that poured from my fevered brow on many the long dark night, obliged by blood. Dicky held up his palm in surprise. It was bleeding. Everard looked at his own. It was bloody also. Their wounds reopened, they again clasped hands, blood on blood as in years gone by. But this time there was no septicemic shock, no, but there was shock as the door creaked open on its rusty hinges. Their fright came from the figure that now stood framed in the doorway, a hideous apparition which looked as if it had emerged from the very bowels of hell. A wizened frame, long, greasy hair, translucent skin pulled taut over skeletal features that forced the eyes to bulge from their sockets and the lips peeled back to expose a leering, toothy grin. The odour of putrefaction was carried into the room by the draught from the landing and threatened to overwhelm them. Both were frozen in mortal fear staring up at the grotesque, livid countenance of what was undeniably the gruesome remains of Housemaster Bedroom. With a hysterical cackle and one mighty leap, Bedroom launched himself at Everard, hurling him backwards onto the floor and pinning him there as talon-like fingers wrapped themselves around his throat. Stunned but determined, Everard attempted to fight off his assailant, as Dicky sprang to his defence, but no amount of punching or kicking seemed to do any good. Everard was fading fast, and Dicky grew increasingly desperate. Then a strange thing occurred, though it could hardly be described as strange among such a set of strange circumstances, as Everard's open palm clasped Bedroom's shoulder in a final attempt to throw him off. Bedroom let out a nightmarish scream as his sleeve burst into flames. It's the blood, Everard croaked. The power is in the blood, Dicky. And grasping the importance of this observation, Dicky encircled his bloody hand around Bedroom's scrawny throat. Instantly he felt the fizz between his fingers, the pop, the crackle of flame forming a ring of fire, and with one mighty wrench the head separated from the body, and Dicky found he was holding it up like a grotesque balloon, a balloon that screamed and yelped in the throes of a second death. Fingers burnt, Dicky dropped the flaming skull. It landed on his boots, and he kicked it into the furthest corner of the room, where it exploded like a fireball. Everard threw aside the headless corpse atop him, which itself then ignited into flame as he leapt to his feet. Now they faced a second but very real wave of terror that the fire now raging would fast spiral out of control. There was no source of water to hand out, 
with necessity being the mother of invention, both men unbuttoned their breeches and doused the flames thanked to surprisingly large bladders. Finally, the stench of putrefaction was replaced by the reek of boiled piss, and what remained of bedroom was nothing more than a pile of steaming mush to be consigned to the bin of legend.